I am Dr. Santikari. I am currently the Vice President and Global Chief Data Officer at ERT. ERT is an e-research technology company, so we are a data and technology company and that minimizes risks and uncertainties in clinical trials. So we are, our customers are pharmaceutical companies, biotechnology companies, medical device companies. So we run clinical trials for them. So today, we are going to talk uh, about the cloud platform that we have built uh, that is running some of the trials as well as minimizing the BI and AI, that kind of thing. So let's uh, jump into it. So a little bit about the company. We are founded in 1977, privately held, about 2,500 employees operations in 12 countries, and obviously, as I said, we support uh, pharmaceutical companies. And uh, so some of the things that uh, we have accomplished over the years, like 50% uh, of the FDA-approved drugs uh, over the past four years used our platform. So you can see the uh, length and breadth of some of the things that we do using our platform. About uh, 550 new drugs got approved uh, using our platform. And 13,000 clinical trials we run. And uh, 230,000 sites, uh, clinical sites that we have access to. And over 3 million patients. Um, obviously, we are global. So, um, what are some of the challenges that clinical trials industry are facing? And why is it so different than some other business domain? So obviously, one of the things that is pushing this industry uh, hard is the data collection itself. So usually, the clinical trials are geographically dispersed, and uh, we use sites as well as patients, and patients use all kinds of devices uh, you know, for data access, multiple access methods, multiple devices, multiple data types, so not just structured. You have lab data, you have imaging data, so all kinds of different types of data. Multiple vendors, uh, and also you know, the patients and all the sites are also geographically uh, dispersed, as I said. And then lots of site qualification related requirements as well. So the data collection itself is a big deal. It's very complex, as you can see. Both real time as well as different types of data of different velocity. Obviously, collection is one thing, and then you have to process that data and also allow that data to be accessible uh, so that uh, the data coming from different sources are also gathered in one place so that pharmaceutical sponsors have access to that integrated data set, high quality data set. That brings to the data quality because when you are bringing all this data from multiple sources, uh, always these data discrepancy and data quality related issues. And regulatory authorities such as FDAs, you know, they, they're always concentrating on the data quality of your trial. So data quality is key because it is related to patient compliance, site compliance, uh, visit compliance, regulatory compliance. So there is a compliance as well as privacy aspect to this whole problem. And then obviously oversight and monitoring. The moment you have too many vendors, too many sites, too many patients, you always need that oversight. So these four things really make the clinical trials industry so complex. And this is one reason um, it is probably one of the most complex business domain that we are seeing right now. So lots of big companies, including, including Google, Amazon, they are actually 
trying to crack this market because this is so rich and data, it's a very complex domain. Before picking up this role, I was the head of data engineering at eBay, but that was like different kinds of data there. You were, you were dealing with consumer data. Lots of volume, real time, everything is, is very interesting, but pharmaceutical domain is, is very, very different. So um, here are some of the data sources that you normally deal with, like, uh, for example, EDC, electronic data capture, because now you see patients uh, are wearing all kinds of devices, and they're capturing data from, from those devices. Clinical trial management system. You have IVR, like, you know, through voice or through chat, you are collecting data. You have all kinds of other devices, like mobile health devices, like Fitbit, Apple Watch, you name it. They're streaming data into the platform. And as I said, images, because oncology patients, for example, they're always using you know, the tumor growth and that kind of images all the time as part of the clinical trial. And the lab data, as part of the clinical trial, patients are going to the labs, uh, taking visits periodically. And all this data is streaming uh, into, into different layers. Some also use home monitoring system because not all patients are coming to the clinical sites for, for you know, clinical trials. Some of them participate remotely. Then you have the medical record, right, the EMR. Then patient engagement. Once the, once the patient is at the clinical site, then you'll have to make sure that you are engaging with that patient through uh, you know, a notification, reminder, that hey, you have a, you have a visit coming two, two days from now. Patient identification. So, so this makes the whole data domain very rich. That's why folks like, like myself are so interested in driving innovation in this area. So uh, on top of that, uh, th there are other things in the industry that are also going on in the clinical trial space that is uh, making things even more complex, including you know, uh, the precision medicine where clinical trials are very targeted. So you, have, you are running like micro trials. Uh, that requires different kind of technology, different, different kinds of governance. Then you have uh, patient centricity. So instead of uh, patients coming to the clinical sites, the clinical trials are coming to the patients. And, and obviously, this is a real big data challenge because we all talk about big data, but the clinical industry, that's where you see not only the velocity of the data, but also the variety. And obviously, the privacy is, is key to what we do. So technology such as blockchain is also uh, a huge popular thing in our industry. So uh, as you can see, uh, exponential data growth, uh, not only the volume, but also the velocity, real timeliness, variety, all kinds of different types of data we are talking about, and then also the data quality. So each of these require a different kind of uh, technical uh, architecture to really deal with this complexity of this domain. So our um, customers, mostly pharmaceutical companies and others, are coming to us and uh, just looking for help because they need to make sure that they're investing multi-billion dollar to launch a drug, they want to make sure that they are successful. Usually it takes 10 to 12 years to launch a drug, about $2 billion. So think about the investment and the risk uh, that, uh, that uh, each trial brings to the table. So uh, that's where we come in and then we run the clinical trials for, for pharmaceutical companies. So um, we'll talk a little bit about the 
architecture that we are using um, and then uh, see how much we can cover a little bit. So we take a very architectural approach to our data platform. So our goal is to uh, put high quality data in the hands of people who need it. That's our uh, data office that I lead. That's the mission of my data office. That data accessibility as well as data monetization. So we take a data governance approach. So we need to make sure because data quality is key to what we do. And the only way you can maintain the quality of the data over time is to institute data governance. So we take a data governance approach. So what kind of data, who manages that data, where the data is coming from, what we are doing with that data, lineage, all those things are a part of the data governance. Obviously, uh, modern data platform just for scale because our industry is all about can you do things for me at scale? So all about scaling because it deals with different data sources, different integration paths, structured, unstructured, and binary data as well. So, and streaming data from all those devices that we talked about. So it is, it is a problem that is screaming for scaling. So that's why it requires a modern data platform approach. And since we are in a very regulated industry, uh, dealing with HIPAA, GDPR, and uh, whatnot, um, we are very regulatory bound. So we want to make sure that we are um, keeping the patient data uh, in a safe place uh, with privacy and security in mind. And then uh, master data management because um, uh, the, the, these two go, go hand in hand. Uh, because you need to have some basic uh, master data and metadata management in place so that uh, you can use both process and technology to drive the data quality. So, uh, but, but again, there are, there are best practices around it. We are not going to go deep into those things, uh, but these two are very, uh, very basic things that uh, any modern platform has to have. So um, the attributes that, uh, that we go for in our platform is, as I said, all about scale. And we are transforming data into strategic uh, business assets using modern, secure, and cloud-based data platform. And scaling is one thing. Obviously, cloud-based, and it's a, it's a modern stack, and governed, as I said, using master data management and data governance. And uh, it supports both real-time and batch architecture, what is called Lambda architecture. I have a slide on that. So uh, some of the benefits that we gain is uh, it enables our customers uh, to do real-time decisioning. Another thing it does is it, it allows us to ingest data at scale. Um, we use uh, both on-prem and cloud because many of our um, systems are still on-prem, but some of our modern platforms and services, they are cloud-enabled. And um, as I said, we are also focused on data monetization because we are sitting on a mountain of data related to so many clinical trials across so many different sponsors and pharmaceutical companies. So uh, our goal is uh, to, uh, to do, do, do uh, data monetization through application of AI and machine learning. As I said, uh, some of the architectural concepts are Basically, it's a layered architecture that enables data of any type to be ingested uh, and, you know, seamlessly into the platform. Uh, not only structured data, but 
also unstructured and binary data. Uh, it, it also deals with uh, polyglot. That means we use different kinds of database technologies based on the use case that we are solving. Sometimes we use relational. That's the most popular one. Sometimes no SQL. So depending on the needs and depending on the problem that we are solving. And obviously, as I said, um, data standards, master data management policies, and, and technical metadata, business metadata, they are key. Because they, they're the glue that, that, that holds everything together. And then the, all the non-functional requirements for the platform, like availability, security, uh, performance, and all those good stuff. Uh, you architect with all those things in mind. So security, for example, is a big deal in our industry, as is privacy. So when we build our platform, we take those attributes into account while architecting our platform. There cannot be an afterthought. And then obviously we have the access layer. You are collecting all these data. How do you enable your users to really use this data across multiple channels? So that can be data science channel through AI. We have open data API so that it allows anybody to access to the data, interact with the data using API. And we have obviously traditional BI because traditional BI is so important. Uh, and, and, and also simple reporting. What you see is what you get because they want to know how is my trial going every day. For that, you don't need AI. You need simple reporting, right? So based on the use cases, uh, you need all different types of channels for data access. So they complement each other. They don't like eliminate each other. So it's not either or. We also use microservices architecture. As you guys probably know, microservices are like, you know, you just do one thing well. Don't try to do too many things within one service so that you can scale that service depending on your need. So in our case, for example, site is a service. Patient is a service. Subject is a service. Study is a service. That kind of thing. That way, if you were running too many trials and you have too many sites that are taking part as part of the trial, that you can selectively scale the site service so that you, know, you don't want to scale the entire application just because site needs more attention in terms of performance or scalability. So you just go uh, uh, scaling uh, individual services. And that's the beauty of uh, the microservices architecture, that at least one of the benefits. There are several other benefits, obviously. Polyglot being one of them. For what, uh, one microservice, you could use no SQL as a backend, but for another service, you could use a relational database as a backend. So it, it gives you that, that, uh, that flexibility in terms of choosing your tech stack. Obviously, uh, it, it allows you to be agile. Uh, it allows you to be innovative. All these things are good, but there are challenges too. So don't jump into a microservices architecture without really understanding the challenges. Because it's a, dis it's a distributed computing um, concept and distributed computing is hard to do, easier to say than, than done, basically. And, uh, and particularly automation and um, organizational issues, you'll have to think, think all those things through as well, as is skill sets, obviously. So sometimes the transition from monolithic to microservices is, is not easy. I would say in most situations, it's not easy. Uh, and then what we also do, because we are uh, using AWS as our cloud vendor, uh, we try to make the best use of some of the services that AWS provides, for example. So one of the things that, that, uh, that AWS provides is 
uh, serverless computing, where you know you further break down your microservices into functions, what they call lambda function. So we we take full advantage of this architecture because. Uh, this is like you know uh, just a compute cost, so that uh, each time you call this function, you pay for that compute usage. So it allows us to also scale individual function, so that so that we know that uh, you know uh, so this is one way of scaling, and then you take each microservice and then break them down into into smaller functions. So this is a relatively modern concept, but uh, it's very useful. We have been using it um, religiously. And uh, as I said, one of the one of the benefit is uh, uh, characteristics is function as a service, compute as a service. You know, stateless, ephemeral because it's it's short lived. So it's not like a long running bad jobs. Usually, you know, between between five minutes to, I think, 10 minutes, they have increased the time horizon, I think, or 20 minutes. Event triggered, so when an event is happening, it is triggering that function. So lots of benefits, uh, uh, coding without, you don't have to provision hardware or VM or EC2 instances, it, it, AWS takes care of that. And then no hardware, no software, you have to increase productivity, obviously. All you do is just bring your code and they just you know, stitch them together, scale horizontally, and almost zero administration. So that's huge. But again, the challenges are vendor lock-in, uh, and, and you are at the behest of the vendor now, right? Monitoring, debugging could be a little difficult. And, and a startup latency, because each time you fire the Lambda function, there is a startup uh, latency there. So you have to make sure if, if your transaction is, uh, uh, you know, uh, if a user is sitting on the other side, uh, you need to make sure whether to choose Lambda function or an EC2-based installation of that, right? So it, it depends on the use case. So make sure you review the use cases first before jumping into any of these modern concepts. But uh, in some of our situations, um, they work very well. This is another um, thing that is, uh, that we use extensively. So our architecture supports both batch and near real time within the same architecture. And in the industry, it is called Lambda architecture, where, as you can see, the data is streaming in, and then you have a real time view of that data because the trial is happening around the world. You need to collect all that data real time, near real time. And then the sponsor, like in this case, let's say Pfizer is running a trial with us. So Pfizer needs to know how their trial is running on a day-to-day -day basis, on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. So you need a near real-time view of the of that data coming from all different sites around the globe, right? And then you need the batch view because you need the collective that that aggregated view, right? So, but but you don't need two different architecture to support your use cases. So we use what is called uh, Lambda architecture. Netflix and others, uh, uh, Amazon, they use this architecture a lot because they, they have that kind of issues, real time and batch, right? So, uh, so this architecture is, um, is hard to implement, but, but uh, once, you, once you implement once and, and go through the kings, I think it's, it's very, very useful. So keep that in mind, uh, uh, you know, as to the usefulness of this. And obviously, just like anything modern, you know, it comes with its own challenges, including skill sets and, and those kind of distributed computing and uh, all, the, all, the, all those good stuff. So um, 
In my office, we also have a data science group. And we do, as I said, we collect so much data. And we have access to so much information. Uh, so the next obvious thing is, how can we use this, this data to really reduce time to market to drugs, for example? As I said, $2 billion takes about 10 years to launch a drug. So are there AI-related use cases that we could use to really you know, shorten that time to market? So patient selection to patient all those different processes that a clinical trial goes through, phase one through phase four, for example, 10 to 12 years, can you shorten that? So we are using um, uh, lots of different AI techniques, obviously, and that's one of the reasons we have built this platform, so that we can do some of these at scale, because everything is about scale. AI itself is all about scale. You can have a model in, let's say, six months, but how do you take that model and put that to use in a production environment to productize it? So two, two entirely different things, because modeling is one piece of a 10-step process. What do you do with the other nine steps, right? That's why, um, you know, Technology savvy companies like, for example, you know, Google or, or Amazon, for example, they, they, they can build all these models very quickly, but also they can take those models in production even quicker because they have, they have built that automated pipeline. So that's what I'm trying to say here that um, even though I'm not going to be talking about AI algorithm, this, that, but what you need is data a, a, an environment where you can, you can really pre-process the data. So pre-processing of the data, like including feature engineering, and these two, if you add, takes sometimes 60 to 70% of the, of the modeling process. People sometimes neglect these two steps only to find out that they are not ready to do the modeling. So you need a platform that enables you to gather all kinds of data quickly and also allows you to process that data quickly. So you need that platform. Feature engineering, as we all know, uh, is an incredibly important step towards modeling. It can be a supervised modeling or it can be unsupervised modeling. You need to know as much of the data as you can, and including feature selection, right? So you can have so many features in your data, but are all those features really important? So how do you uh, reduce the dimensions, what they call, right, in AI space? Similarly, feature extraction. You can have 10 different features, but based on your understanding of the data, you find out that you can really mix and match some of these features and come up with a, your own feature. That way, you reduce the dimension and also you know, uh, come up with your own feature. That's a derived feature, feature extraction. So these are, in order to do all this quickly, you need a platform that enables you to do, uh, play with your data quickly, because people sometimes forget that. And then the algorithm choice, obviously. That's, you know, you, you need, to, you, you need to, there are like so many algorithms under a given set, right? Um, if it is a classification problem, it's a regression problem, or it's a clustering problem, or what not, you just, based on your domain, you, you come up with, uh, with that kind of choice, and then obviously once you, sometimes it could be hybrid. You, you start with an unsupervised learning to understand, and then use a supervised learning on top of that. So, uh, so, uh, so, so th this is an art, uh, art by itself. So you need 
a platform that scales. So, um, and then obviously, uh, as, as I was telling you, that once you have the model from here to there, it's, it's very complex. It is, you can have a model running on your laptop in six months, let's say, but how do you take that model and then really implement it so that it learns dynamically, it adjusts dynamically. You can have like concepts such as winner and challenger, right? So there are, there are uh, productization of a model is, uh, is an art. There is no like one, one way to productize a model. Each use case is different, right? Uh, some, some requires like 95% accuracy versus some maybe 80% accuracy, right? Depending on your use case. Uh, sometimes, let's say your model is spitting out wrong results. How do you deal with them? Can you use the production data to train the model dynamically? There are, there are ways to, you can, you can do all those. So when you try to implement all those concepts, uh, this becomes a real challenge. So when you do AI modeling, um, my experience suggests that the easiest part is this one. That's, that's the easiest part. The hardest part is this one. And then these two are go hand in hand. So keep that in mind. Um, sometimes we get bogged down into the algorithm choice and uh, all the nitty gritty of, you know, uh, doing the, uh, working on the algorithm and, and uh, accuracy, and the, those are important, definitely those are important, but as are the other, other steps that I talked about. So I think with that, I will just try to summarize some of the things that, that are uh, applicable not only to clinical research, but, but, but any other data-driven complex business domain. You need a data governance in place. Now, data governance uh, have so many different definitions in the literature, but simply you need to make sure that you know the quality of the data, you can maintain the quality of the data, you know where the data is coming from, you also know that there are business users involved in maintaining the quality of the data. So some basic tenants should be in place before you either build a data warehouse or data platform or data mart, does not matter. You have to have certain basic things in place. Some people have centralized data governance. Some don't. Sometimes you don't need centralized governance. Localized governance is just fine. Whatever works, in your organization. Sometimes um, if you are a new small company, maybe a centralized governance may work out. But let's say if your company is, has grown through acquisition and you have acquired like 30 companies, in our case, for example, we have been around over 50 years, like we acquired last year alone seven companies. So having a centralized governance, it's, it's very hard because each company is bringing their new ideas, their innovations. So sometimes centralized governance may stifle innovation. So you'll have to just make sure what works for you. Second thing is modern data foundation, right? Everybody wants to do AI. Everybody wants to do data lake. Everybody wants to do whatever, right? It does not matter. The data governance have to be there so that you, you know that you have control over the quality of the data, you have the right process. Then choose tools and technologies and build a strong foundation to bring the data in, ingest it, integrate it. All those things are technical problems. But if your input is not good, if, if there are users who are not contributing to the quality of the data, 
then your output will be not trustworthy. So no matter whether it is data lake or data warehouse or data mart, sooner or later people are not people are going to stop using them. So that's why as important as data foundation is to do other stuff, make sure you start with governance in mind, governance in mind, because that is tied to the data quality. And then obviously, since uh, depending on which domain you are from, data security and, and data access is critical. Because you know, in our case, for example, we are highly regulated. Similarly, finance industries or insurance industries or banking industries, you know, they are also highly regulated. Energy industries, right? Uh, so, so each industry is different. So their access, their privacy rules, their security rules, more or less, you know, that they will be different. So you have to have a foundation in your architecture uh, that allows you to really tackle some of these challenges. Particularly in our case, for example, we run clinical trials uh, globally. Most of the clinical trials are global. When Pfizer runs a trial or Mark runs a trial with us, you know, usually they are running the trials around the globe. So now Europe has GDPR rules where you, you just don't take data generated there and then move them over to somewhere else. There are personally identified information that you can't share. All kinds of rules there. So your architecture needs to support all those. So, um, so these are the three things in summary uh, that, uh, that I have on mind, where the, uh, as important as architecture is, uh, the other governance and security and performance and all those things are equally important. I think uh, with that in mind, I think I'll be happy to take, take questions. I have a couple of minutes, I guess. Any questions? Yeah. All right, then. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Sir.